Good afternoon, everyone. I hope that you've had a really, really uh, engaging, uh, very informative, and just a fun-filled day, uh, totally immersed in what the Harker Science Department and the research program uh, has to offer uh, for both uh, uh, parents as well as uh, for students. What we wanted to do was, now that you've sort of seen all the, the different activities uh, that we're engaged in, um, you're probably wondering, well, what's next for me? Where do I go from here? Um, this uh, session is geared more towards our young students that are in the audience right now after having heard uh, these in incredible students describe their research, we're thinking that you might be wondering, well, how do I get started? And so those of you that are in middle school right now, or maybe even younger, uh, we want to describe to you what the science department has to offer. Uh, apart from uh, engaging in uh, research, there are other opportunities. And then let the students, who we consider to be the experts uh, in research, tell you about uh, some of the tips uh, to give you some ideas and answer some of your questions. So first of all, uh, the science department, uh, the upper school science department at Harker offers much more than just uh, the research competitions uh, that you may have heard of. I want to make sure that uh, parents and students who are now in middle school are aware that besides the internship placement, which we do offer, uh, we have a few other things. So obviously we have a very, very rich uh, academic program. But we also have the opportunity for students to engage in, in research in what we call the open lab program. And the open lab is like an extracurricular day, uh, sorry, an extracurricular um, activity or opportunity. Harker teachers are the supervisors and mentors, and students engage in independent research, usually in teams when they're younger. Uh, but they can start as freshmen, and this, the opportunities are after school, uh, and there is one lunch hour session as well. The other thing is to get involved in a club. So there are, is the research club. You might have heard of the Harker Horizon, which is an opportunity to actually write and be published online. That's something new that Mr. Spenner and his group have put together. Um, there's the robotics club. There's WISTEM. There are multiple clubs that are uh, very, very interesting to someone who is uh, uh, looking at research or uh, is interested in STEM. We also offer research expeditions over the summer as an introduction to research, but in an international setting. Or uh, this year, we're uh, going to Alaska for the first time. Uh, we're also going to Costa Rica uh, at the end of the summer. and. Uh, both of those are not only involved in looking at uh, how do you do research, but also have the focus of service, as well as understanding some of the issues uh, in other countries w in relation to uh, conservation practice, and just understanding how it is that you can make a difference in the world. Um, so those are some of the things that the science department does. As far as uh, competition coordination, I would like to turn it over to Mr. Spenner, who will describe this. Uh, thank you, yeah, I'm Mr. Spenner. Um, we do offer uh, kind of extra coordination for certain competitions. Um, to some extent, uh, Harker faculty can be mentors for the students. Sometimes their projects go beyond our expertise, so we're just kind of there for support or feedback. Um, especially when they get to, uh, to the level where these guys are at. Uh, we're, we're mostly just giving them feedback on their writing, helping them communicate better. Um, but there are coordinated efforts around that, so when they're writing their papers, if they're taking the class, or even if they're not, they can sign up to have a, a Harker teacher read their papers. Um, we coordinate transportation for the Synopsis Science Fair. Uh, we sponsor many projects for other competitions. So there are quite a few ways in which we do this stuff. One thing I'll add, though, is just by way of advice, um, uh, Mana mentioned during lunch that he remembered as a freshman walking into a room and picking up a magazine and, and asking questions of the teacher, happened to be me, uh, to, to, to just kind of get going, get some ideas. And that, that first step really has to come from the student. We aren't going to go seek you out and invite you to do research. If you're going to do research, you need to come, uh, at least take that first step, ask questions, 
look for help. Um, that's, that's a critical piece. Okay, um, so I guess I'll talk about why you should do research, and I, I'm not sure if that's a question that's a little bit rhetorical, but I'll answer it anyways. Um, so really, like when you go to Harker, you're, you have a lot of great science classes, and so you'll be challenged by a lot of the material. Um, you'll learn a lot of concepts, take the tests, prepare for the exams and all that stuff. Um, but really, you have not as many opportunities to do your own projects and work on things that you come up with yourself. So like a lot of times in classes, the labs are already pre-written for you. You follow the instructions, you get the results, and you write them up. But with research, you can actually come up with your own projects and follow the really what you want to do. And so it's really independent, innovative thinking. Um, another thing that, about research is that you're going to collaborate with a lot of people. So whether you're doing an individual project or a team project, you're going to be working with other students, your teachers, uh, if you go to university, a university, prof university professor. Uh, so a lot of collaboration. You know how to work with people, collaborate with people, and, um, and work towards common goals. A third key thing about research is that you learn to communicate your work. So you're actually presenting something that you originally came up with, work through the process of, of getting the results, and then actually uh, found results. Um, so you need to be able to communicate your work, and that's a really important part of research. Uh, one thing I learned from Mr. Spanner's class this year is that if you can't communicate your work, your work is useless. So you need to learn how to communicate. Um, the second thing about research that's really important is that it's very process oriented. So it's not just like in some classes where there's a question, then you give, give the teacher an answer, and that, that's the end of the story. Um, you have to go through the entire process. You have to go through the entire motion of the, of the scientific process. And so you're, you have to overcome a lot of challenges along the way. So your pro project might fail along the way. You need to rebuild it and find workarounds. Uh, you're also setting your own goals and working step by step. So it's not somebody telling you, like, this is how you do your project. You are actually telling yourself how to do your own project, because it's your project. Um, and then finally, you're, at the end of the day, when you come up with your project, you work through the scientific method, and then you come up and you get your results. You're actually seeing the, the fruits of your own work. So it's not somebody else that said, like, this is a, a known fact. You actually came up with something yourself. And that's a pretty cool thing um, that I think draws everybody here back to science. Uh, okay, so uh, in terms of my personal four-year experience, uh, research was very similar to what Sandip talked about. It's really something that's process-driven and something that you yourself uh, have to have the initiative to do. So if you're not really interested in research or if you don't really have that drive uh, for a particular project, you should definitely select the project that interests you the most. And I think that's probably the most crucial thing that I've learned over four years. I've done projects uh, in fields of like microbiology and astrophysics in middle school, but really in high school, the most essential part of my experience was to find out what was right for me and to work on that and to really love the whole process of working on research. So um, in particular, in ninth grade, uh, I worked on an independent project at Harker Labs that was about uh, the uh, identifying the uh, propagation of solar flares uh, and, uh, and, it's, and their effect in the solar magnetosphere. And that as Mr. S Mr. Spenner said, really came out of a Scientific American magazine. And that was something that introduced me to the field of computer science and really got, uh, got me into what research was like at the high school. It's something where the teachers are much more hands-off than in middle school. It's a place where you get to conduct your own research. You have excellent teachers with wonderful expertise who are willing to guide you. But it's your project, it's your results, and everything is you-driven. I think that's really important to remember. Um, in my sophomore year, I also worked on an independent project at uh, the Harker Labs, and my sophomore project had to do with um, identifying the sentiment of tweets on a large scale. And again, this is like very different from my first project uh, on the solar magnetosphere, but I learned a lot about big data analytics and informatics from that project as well. And I was lucky enough to get selected to go to the CSSF, which is the California State Science Fair, which is a progression of the uh, synopsis fair uh, for students who are selected. Um, in my junior year, I worked at uh, the Stanford Imaging Labs on a project involving diagnosing the severity of diabetic retinopathy. And I think it was really my sophomore, junior year that I got really interested in computer science and the theoretical side and then applications to medical fields. So this project I worked on uh, at, at Stanford Labs and I also received a lot of help from Harker. So this is a team project. So we both were able to work on our paper together. We were able to talk to faculty for feedback and information, like Mr. Spenner said. And all of that feedback uh, allowed us to uh, reach the semen semifinalist stage and also qualify to the Intel ISEF 
in my junior year. And finally, as a senior, um, I worked on a project at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, uh, which, is a, which is an affiliate hospital of the Harvard Medical School. And this project primarily focused on assessing the severity of uh, tumor proliferation, as you've all heard already. And uh, for this project, I was uh, also, it was an independent project, but at the same time, I got a significant amount of help from Mr. Spenner, Ms. Chetty, setting up the whole process of working through a Siemens paper, working through a Regeneron paper, and I was also, uh, and, and it was a phenomenal experience. So I guess the main things that would come out of my experience are primarily to really focus on what you're passionate about and find what you're really interested in. And once you find that sweet spot to pursue it, um, work hard uh, and just keep doing what you love. And at the end of the day, uh, if that's really, really what you do, um, then the results are much less important than the process and what you put into it. And I'm saying this seriously, uh, especially coming from Harker where a lot of the uh, but a lot of focus is results driven for research primarily it's process driven you need to love the process to get good results so there's that so this is just uh, to let parents know sometimes you have uh, a child who is just not you they're not sure if they're at all interested in in research and uh, they've never done a project, uh, it's always a, a good opportunity for you to let them go on one of our research expeditions, and this might be sort of the beginning. So for example, a freshman who is not able to take the research class because it doesn't fit into their, their uh, schedule could, in the summer of their uh, rising sophomore, could go on one of these research expeditions, and that would just sort of ignite that interest. Um, it's certainly not uh, designed to be uh, something that would culminate in a, a paper, or it doesn't necessarily even have to go to, to become a synopsis project. The important thing is igniting that interest, sparking that, that enthusiasm for research. This is why we, we do these expeditions. So it's something for you to keep in mind. And Mr. Spenner will discuss our research classes. Yes, we have uh, two different research classes. One is research methods. It's a year-long introductory course. Um, anybody can take it after freshman physics. Uh, it, it's about a semester of basic skills training, including experimental design, um, quantitative analysis, all kinds of things, presentations. Um, the second semester is more wide open. So the first semester culminates in a proposal for a project. The second semester, the students conduct the project in the class. Uh, the, the other class we have is advanced research. It is much more of an independent study for students who have either taken the intro class or they've already done an internship somewhere. Um, this, I, I, most of the students on the stage have taken this class. Uh, this is really fun for me because they come back and I learn more from them than they do from me. I'm, I'm really, I'm barely a teacher there. I'm a, I'm a facilitator. Um, but uh, I, I think the common theme of both classes is that it's, it's about building a community. Uh, among the students, they learn from each other, um, not just within one class, but it's also what I call a cumulative investigation model. So they are preparing documentation that students in future years can use. They're keeping good lab notebooks so that other students in later years can build off of that work, uh, more the way real science works. Okay, um, so I've taken both classes, uh, research methods and advanced research, and um, I've enjoyed both of them immensely. Uh, so I came into sophomore year and I took um, the research methods class, uh, and I got, you know, I came to, up to Mr. Spenner and I said I had this idea about um, can we convert thoughts into brain waves? So can we, or sorry, can we convert um, brain waves into speech? Right? Can we give, if somebody's thinking about a letter, can we identify what letter they're thinking about? Uh, and it's a pretty wild idea, um, but Mr. Spenner, you know, it, basically the whole point of the class is go for it, right? Uh, and so that was a lot of fun, and then predictably, not even surprisingly, Harker had a machine to read brain waves. Um, and so I used that machine, uh, and I collected data from subjects, and I, uh, designed an, a machine learning algorithm to predict. Um, and so that g being given not only the space uh, to do that in a classroom setting, but also the resources um, and the support from, uh, from Mr. Spenner especially uh, to, to do that project was, uh, was fantastic. Um, 
yeah, and then also advanced research. Uh, I've taken advanced research both in my junior and uh, senior year, and that, as he said, it's more of an independent study class. It gives you the space um, to say you did a, a research project over the summer, which most people who took the class did. Then you can work on your paper, get feedback from Mr. Spenner, um, and it also gives you space to work on pretty much anything you want to do. So open lab as well. Uh, you know, if you want, if you're doing a project outside of a class, but not, but still inside school, uh, after school there's um, open lab uh, pretty much d during that time uh, in the middle of the year. And so you can go into the lab and do research and there'll be uh, a teacher there uh, who, can, who can help you. And so you can, you know, get, uh, start working on a project in, in Harker itself. There's a lot of great resources up. There's a lot of people who are doing like work with cells or work with bacteria and you can do that uh, in Harker itself. So it pretty much gives you a lot of resources to do almost university level projects. Um, and then yeah, uh, Siemens and Intel competition. So you, uh, a lot of us have entered uh, both or one of those competitions. And so by, first of all, by taking the advanced research class, um, you can write your paper for Siemens or Intel. So say you did an internship and you got a research project out of it over the summer, you start writing a paper. Um, and so uh, Mr. Spenner can give you feedback about it um, and you can really find the best way to communicate results. And so uh, Harker does a really great job of providing that support for you to enter these competitions um, and for you to succeed in those competitions and to really put uh, your work out in the best way possible. Personal experiences. Um, there's been, uh, you know, research, the high school research is not is kind of different from research once you go out of high school in the way that you're trying to do a research project in a short amount of time and get great results, right? And that's very difficult. And so there's often times where, you know, you'll, you'll be working on a project and then you experience, uh, you know, you work on it for a long time and you're not able to get those results. Um, and failure is okay. I, in ninth grade, I, I spent a year working at a wet lab on trying to cure Parkinson's to try to uh, treat, help treat my grandfather. Um, and after spending a year, I, I walked away because my professor said, you know, we can't fund this project anymore. It's not working. So, okay. But what I learned from that experience is that even though I spent all that time for, for nothing, it's what actually inspired me to continue working on problems that, um, you know, that impact people's lives. And it's, it, 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 failure actually kind of, you can learn from it. Uh, I can learn from the mistakes that I made and then given the next project, you know, let's not make the same mistakes, uh, see how I can uh, not repeat the same mistakes and kind of uh, move forward from there. So, yeah. Before our students start talking uh, about internship programs, so we've just, uh, Arjun has just uh, sort of done a bit of a segue because up to this point, we've been talking about Harker Labs, which is our, uh, will soon be trademarked, I think. Uh, that, that is our own uh, research program here at Harker. But when you step out into that university setting, we call it an internship. But I wanted to define for you the different types of programs that are available out there. And sometimes they call themselves internships, but it may or may not be what you're looking for. So if it is um, a class that you are taking where you're, uh, you, you have lectures, this is I'm talking about the summer right now. So if you're sitting in a class, you're taking notes, you're doing labs, that's all great. It's, it's an academic program, and some colleges offer these opportunities. Sometimes they call them camps, uh, but if that's not what you're looking for, if you're actually looking for an independent research experience, then that's not it. Um, the other one is that you may, it, it, they may call it an internship, but in fact it's more like a shadowing opportunity, or it might be um, <clears throat> it's a clinical internship where you're there is a doctor or several doctors, for example, and you're on site, but you're not conducting research. You're just learning more about that career itself. So what we're talking about, and when the students begin describing research internships, what they're talking about is something that is a little more, little more somewhat structured, I would say, but a little more independent. So first of all, a real research internship is anywhere between eight to 10 weeks long. 
you need that much time in order to really spend the quality time that's required to dig pretty deep into a topic. It can be a group of high school students that are in a university setting. They're living there for the summer. Or it could be one where you're staying at home and commuting to it. But it, as long as it is eight to 10 weeks long and you're actually working in a lab under the guidance of a research mentor, you are conducting some type of independent research project. You are collecting data on your own. Um, and there can be trips, there can be additional lectures um, associated with the program, but you have to make sure that you're actually conducting a research project. It might lead to a research paper, it may not, and the students will tell you about that, that sometimes it doesn't lead to one. But the important thing is that you went through the process. You learned how to navigate your way through a research lab. You are working with adults. And you're learning about what real research looks like out there in that academic environment. So I'll let the students uh, give you more advice and information about research internships. OK, I'll just stand because it's easier to see. Um, so in terms of, there are several like there are three ways in which you can get an internship. For one is through an applied uh, structured research program. And so for many of these, these require uh, teacher recommendations or a resume or information, um, transcripts. And so you want to be able to keep on track of those deadlines because they require um, advance notice for your teachers. Um, and these are due around uh, January to March. Um, another alternative is to an independent internship, so where you're contacting a professor um, and working under their mentorship. So my advice for this is to really reach out to many professors because they're often very busy and you're unlikely to get a response. It's also good to reach out to postdocs because they're usually more available and more willing to help out high school students. Um, when you send emails to these professors and postdocs, you want to be sending a personalized email and really look into what research area they're doing and make sure that it matches your interests. Um, you know, mention specific publications that you've read, maybe potential ideas of how, of how you can uh, work on projects or extend, work on extensions of their projects. Um, and I think in terms of when you should be doing this, I think as soon as possible because um, the later it is, the harder um, it is to find actually a professor who can support you and provide that sort of mentorship. And then finally, there are also internships where you can apply through Harker. So Harker selects students um, and those are uh, all available, uh, the deadlines are all available on the Athena website as well as for the other research internships. So I think there's a lot of information on that site as well about how you can be contacting the professors. Sure. So there's two things that Ivani just mentioned and uh, one is about the Athena web page. So there is a, a web page that we have that's the research and competitions web page that the students can access through a access code. So upper school students, if you're interested in that, you can get that code from us to access uh, Athena. Um, if you are um, currently in, in middle school, we can pass the information on, but it's important for you to understand that you can't get into a research lab unless you are 16 years of age and you also have to have some academic courses under your belt uh, before you can actually engage in research. But there is an opportunity for you after, after freshman year. Um, there are some internships that you can engage in. So I just want to make sure that you're clear w when we're referencing there is an Athena page and we can get that information to you. The other thing is that this particular PowerPoint, if after we're done, uh, if you would like a copy of it, we can certainly email that to you. If you just email me, Anita C. at harker.org, I will send you a copy of this PowerPoint with all the information so you don't have to try and write it all down at the end of this long day. Uh, so yeah, so Ivani did an excellent job talking about how to find an internship, but once you're there, there's a whole different environment than 
what you traditionally find in high school. So in high school, you have classes, you have grades, you have uh, some sort of final exam, and then you go home at the end of the day and you do completely different things than what you did at school. And none of that is true at an internship. So um, in particular, when you're working at an internship, you're working with a professor who has uh, been gracious enough to take you on as a high school student and work with you on developing a research project. And as Arjun said, you have eight to 10 weeks to produce some sort of meaningful result if you want to apply to a competition. Now, there's different types of research and eight to 10 weeks might not always be enough for your research. So you might want to do a two-year project, but that's something you have to figure out with your uh, mentor beforehand. When you're at the research lab, you're no longer in a high school environment. You're traditionally working alongside P, uh, maybe alongside your PI, but most likely grad students and postdocs, all of whom are working on research that they actually get funded for and research that uh, that is actually their job. So what you're, uh, when you talk to uh, others in your lab, you have to be cognizant of the fact that um, they have lots of stuff to do and lots of other things to do and lots of probably better things to do than talking to a high school student 24-7 uh, about things that you need to understand. So when you walk into your internship, you have to be ready for that type of environment where, again, you're working on your own, you have access to the resources that are at the lab, and you can definitely ask questions when you're working in the lab. But at the same time, you need to be knowledgeable enough and driven enough to look up a lot of things by yourself and get to the end result by yourself, uh, meet the deadlines that your professor requires, and always think, live, and breathe research, especially if you're working on an internship that starts at 8 a.m., ends at 6 p.m. You don't get to go home and just like mess around or do uh, or relax. When you're working at an internship, every single second is crucial, especially because working on research in high school is hard enough at it, as it is. So I guess... The core aspects of an internship are always working, which is, which is a great thing if you love your project and a horrible thing if you don't. So that's why I would really recommend finding a project that you really love. Um, always staying in touch with your mentor, providing him or her updates with uh, your project status, where you're what you're working on, what you might need help with, and staying on top of the subjects that are really interesting, uh, that are core to your research. So if you're working on a machine learning project, know what libraries to use, know how to code, know what, get, have the math fundamentals down, linear algebra, and uh, at least calculus are definitely necessary for that sort of field. And if you're working in other, um, other types of environments, at least have the background knowledge necessary to be able to conduct the research by yourself. And if you have all of those things, you could form a great relationship with your mentor, your PI, and, and, if, and if you have that, you can always uh, develop your research further, work with them for multiple years, and really enjoy your research process. Research should be a very fun thing, and it can be insofar as you um, have the tools, the skills, and the background knowledge necessary for a great experience. Yeah. Uh, just to add that, like, the first, um, the first few days, the first few weeks that you spend in the internship are extremely important. It's, it's been my personal experience, and I think that it's pretty universal that when you come into a lab, uh, the grad student, the professor, the postdoc, they're going to think, they're going to underestimate you, right? They're going to think, they're not going to know how much you know. Only you know how much you know. And so if you're given a project, show that initiative, show that hard work, show that, um, you know, you can knock that project out of the park. Um, and so if you show, if you prove yourself, basically, right, that's what you need to do in the first few weeks. And then um, you can really start... Uh, you know, collaborating with that, uh, with your mentor, and really uh, get working on that project um, better. So. Uh, okay, so a few additional uh, points about the internship experience. I think the probably the most important one is the first point about clarifying your expectations with your mentor. Uh, so this also happens before you really get into the environment, but you need to make sure that you know what you're getting into. There are professors that if you work on confidential research, if you're working with data sets that have not been released, if you're working as part of a larger project, many of those projects won't allow, professors won't allow you to publish research independently or engage in competitions where you have to share parts of those data sets. So if you want to work towards a competition, be sure to clarify that and tell your professor that, for example, I want to apply to the synopsis competition or the STS or the Siemens competition. Is there any part of this project that would prohibit me from doing so? And have that clarified before you start your project because if you don't and you finish your project and you're very excited, then you're told that you can't do anything with it, that might be a severe disappointment. So at least know what you're getting in for. And a lot of research is does not necessarily have to be um, competition driven. So if you really want to just do research for the fun of it, then that's also excellent. That's a wonderful thing. I'd recommend that a lot. And yeah, also clarify that with your, with your mentor as well. 
um, working in a research environment as a high schooler is also an incredibly uh, unique and a valuable experience. So be sure to treasure every single moment you have, especially if you're working at a lab that you know is world renowned for uh, any particular type of field. Be sure that you know uh, that you enjoy every moment of it and take full advantage of the resources you have there. Don't just be that guy in the corner working on your computer. Engage in the lab, interact with the other professors, and be part of that environment because that environment is something you won't see again until college or maybe beyond. Um, and yeah, so that also covers collaborating with your lab mentors. And Arjun also covered a really big thing that's really important, which is don't be discouraged by failure. Um, and this is also like just true in general with research. Uh, when you see papers that are published at the top conferences, none of them are done in eight weeks. They're normally done in a year, and they require collaborations, interdisciplinary collaborations with multiple fields. So finishing a project in eight weeks is pretty much impossible. Uh, that means that the work you do, you have to make sure that you know what you're, uh, you, you really know your stuff, and you have to be okay with cutting your project a little bit short for your time constraints and working on it later at a much reduced capacity when you're in high school. And you also have to be ready to um, have some sort of deliverable at the end of the project if you're working towards a competition and be aware of the timelines because summer passes by really quickly and five days a week in a lab is simply not enough ac uh, for, uh, across your summer to finish a project. So you really have to work, be fast and efficient with the work you're doing. Um, and finally, also really important is to keep detailed records of the methods and results. If you're working towards a publication, this is super important to make sure that uh, your project is reproducible. Keeps, uh, if you're working in a computer science project, save your code, version control. If you're working on other types of labs, like a biology lab or a chemistry lab, keep a notebook. Keep track of what methods you're doing, what, what methods you're working on. Because at the end of the day, if you have 50 different figures uh, scattered on your desktop and you don't know what corresponds to what, what's most important is to have a lab notebook to keep track of what you're doing and make sure that you can reproduce those results. Because the core of research is reproducibility. And if you, don't have, if you don't even know your own methods to get to a certain point, then there's no way you can expect others to be able to um, verify your results and confirm that your result, research is valid. So um, also, in, for competition's sake, synopsis judges like to see notebooks, the, pro the process, your thinking process, your development. So the moral of the story is always keep a pro uh, notebook, keep a set of uh, guidelines regarding what you've done and what you plan to do in the future uh, to help you stay on track and to also help others know what you're doing and understand what, uh, how you got where you are. Okay. <laughs> um, a lot of this I already covered um, re uh, about uh, expe your expectations versus reality. Uh, and you really have no idea what you're getting in for until you actually step foot in the lab. So be ready for a completely different environment. And like I said before, uh, when you're working, for example, at Stanford, Berkeley, UCLA, UCSF, all those environments are incredible places that you're fortunate enough to get into, so make sure you make the most of it, keep lasting connections with your professors, your PI, other graduate students, things along those natures, because they will help you in the future as well. If you're working in a lab, it's a really good idea to step outside and go to neighboring labs to get to know some of those people who may be doing research in areas that are unrelated. But this is an opportunity for you to network and perhaps that will open some doors for you for a different research internship, perhaps something that you are even more passionate about. So make sure that you use this opportunity not just to be so intently focused on completing your project but in, in perhaps developing something for yourself for the future. All right, so you've gone ahead and done your research. Now it's time to write the paper and do a presentation. Now the fun really begins, right? Rajiv. All right, so I'll be talking a little about uh, writing a paper. So this is mostly, again, uh, as Ms. Shetty mentioned, um, after you finish an internship, uh, if you're interested in submitting that to a competition, especially Siemens, that's the really fast one that uh, the, the deadline is like right after school starts. <clears throat> so, to write a paper, uh, and I think uh, naturally the first point here is begin early, and I think that's really important. So when you think about profession, uh, professional research, uh, often what happens is uh, the research project will take um, anywhere from maybe eight months to a couple of years, but uh, the revision process of getting a paper submitted to a journal can be that long. Um, it can be a year or even longer uh, in a lot of cases. So uh, if there's anything we can learn from that, it's that um, 
with a high school internship, you need to be spending like that same ratio of time on your papers. So if you're doing an eight-week internship, you really want to start um, somewhere around that fourth or fifth week, or just as early as possible on your paper, even if it's just the, the, the early sections like the introduction or, or the methods. Uh, you really want to get started uh, pretty fast uh, because before you know it, the Stevens deadline will be there. Um, and you won't have much time. And so, so writing the paper is, is just really critical because that's the only thing that the, the, the judges get to see. Um, you might have done some really great research, but if you're not able to communicate that um, in a really nice paper, then um, that's all for naught. Um, so with writing a paper, doing background research is obviously important, especially with the introduction, uh, citations of other research in your field, getting the reader oriented is obviously pretty critical. Um, and yeah, taking notes during your internship, uh, as like usually with the lab notebook, is uh, definitely going to be really uh, helpful down the line once you actually get to that paper stage. Uh, definitely talk to um, Harker teachers. So we actually have a really nice program that Machete's organized that's been around for several years now. Um, basically, if you're interested in, in, in submitting to Siemens, uh, you'll you'll sign up uh, the previous year. Um, the, so at the end of the the, the previous school year. Um, and at the start of the next school year, you'll be assigned a faculty mentor that is actually willing to read your paper and give you feedback on that. Um, and that can be really helpful uh, as you move along with that process. Um, and a lot of students do use this thing called LaTeX. If you're not familiar with what that is, that's just a typesetting, uh, it's just typesetting software uh, that makes things more, cu more customizable, but it is kind of a hassle to learn. So I don't think this is a critical step. Um, but if you if you want to do that, especially as you get older, to your junior and senior years, you can definitely do that. All right, so a few more things. Um, as, as I kind of alluded to before, the order that you do stuff doesn't really matter. Uh, oftentimes, you'll be writing your methods section first because that's what um, really requires, or that's what you can get started with really early uh, because you know what you're doing. You know the types of stuff you're doing uh, pretty early on in your work. Um, and yeah, another pretty important thing is to clearly delineate uh, what you're doing versus what has been done before in the field, uh, especially for things, uh, especially for really hot fields like deep learning for, for uh, improving medicine, which is something we heard a lot about today. Um, there's a lot of work being done there, so clearly, delineate, clearly describing what you did versus what has been done before um, is going to be really important in uh, getting your reader to be oriented. Um, and then you also, so that sort of ties into the importance and significance. Um, and then you also do want to talk about your impacts uh, a lot, especially for high school research competitions. Um, a lot of what they're focused on is um, impacts, and this is something that's actually, um, it's not, I, I personally don't think it's ideal, um, but if you do some really like high quality basic research, oftentimes if you don't uh, sort of tie that to some impacts that have uh, actual real world impacts, then you won't get as much recognition. So if you are submitting to competitions, um, I would try to, to focus on real-world impacts, at least uh, to some extent, within your paper. Um, but I think we should also go back to the question of what are the goals of writing a paper? Um, and again, the, the big goal that we, that, that we would like you to think about, uh, and it's hard to get lost in sort of all these different competitions and wanting to win, but what we'd like you to focus on when writing a paper is uh, more of a personal improvement and just being able to communicate your work really effectively because that's critical. Uh, that'll be critical to your to your future as well. So, um, don't get lost in in all of these competitions and, and all that stuff. Try to try to keep your keep your eyes open to the bigger goals. Um, and one more thing I wanted to mention that's not listed here is the importance of figures. I cannot overest I cannot um, overestimate how 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 important figures are to to your paper. Um, if you write a bunch of text and it's like Pulitzer Prize worthy text, like it doesn't matter. You need figures uh, if you want to win or if you want to be successful. Uh, any good paper, like it, all the top papers will have really high quality figures, and obviously in high school, um, it's hard to replicate that, but um, definitely put a lot of time into, into learning uh, uh, graphic design. Um, I think that's a really important skill you can pick up during your research, and it really helps uh, tell your story. Uh, you saw some great figures with the STS finalist talks. Uh, I would, uh, but, but they obviously have a lot of experience doing that stuff. Um, but even like uh, one of the freshman projects that I mentored, um, this year, um, I saw their board at, at the Synopsis Science Fair, and I was just like incredibly impressed by their figures. So that what that told me, I think one of them is actually in the audience there. Arzu, good job. Um, so what that told me is that uh, anyone is is able to make these figures as long as they spend enough time on them. And uh, I think that just made uh, her poster much clearer to to, to the reader. So 
again, I don't, I cannot overestimate the importance of figures in papers. Okay. <laughs> okay, so for oral presentations, you saw a lot of those today. Um, oral presentations are really important because when you're talking to your audience, you're, you're able to convey stuff that you might not be able to convey in writing. Um, so the first thing you want to think about when you're doing an oral presentation is to know who your audience is. Uh, so in a lot of cases, it'll be if you're presenting to in like a scientific conference, there'll be a lot of experts in your field. Uh, if you're presenting at uh, more of a general audience uh, kind of conference, it'll be more like people who don't know the field as well, but might have some background in science uh, in general. Um, so you need, you need to know how to adjust the length of your talk. Uh, and the depth of your talk based on who you're talking to. Uh, so for an audience that is not as familiar with the with your topic and you have a very narrow topic, you want to explain the things that you did in very great depth so that people understand what you actually did. Uh, and really, if you can't tell them what you did, then why should they believe that you did it? Um, so you really need to know your project inside out because you did your project, so you should probably know it. Um, you need to know a couple of key things, especially here that I've listed. So first of all, what was your research question? So what was the goal of your research when you set out um, a couple months ago to, to do your research? And then what did you find? So can you tell me in like one sentence what you actually found in your research, not just like a bunch of abstract things, like tell me very concretely what you found. And then finally, and most importantly, like uh, Rajiv just mentioned, why does it matter? Because uh, if you can't tell me why your science matters, then Really, I mean, there's a lot of science out there that's great, but it doesn't matter, so I don't really care about it. Um, so I really need to ex explain to your audience why your science matters. Uh, and um, I think one of the other panelists was talking about synopsis and how they really care about the process. I think your thought process is important wherever you're presenting your research. So if you're talking to an audience, you need to tell them how uh, you got from point A to point C. You need to tell your story. Um, and so uh, really want to consider that when you're doing an oral presentation. It's really important for conveying your ideas. Okay, uh, so poster presentation. So uh, you might have seen in the gym and, and the rotunda, there were a lot of poster presentations. This is also the format for synopsis, which is the big regional science fair around here. Uh, so you use a poster to communicate your research. Uh, in, you, you want to communicate really a summary of your research um, because you don't have a lot of space and you also you want to attract your audience uh, with figures, as Rajiv just said. Um, so figures are nice and pictures are nice because people like to look at pictures. Um, so you really want to include only the most important information on your on your poster. You don't want to overload it with a bunch of text because really nobody's going to read like eight point font. Uh, so you want to put a lot of big fi big pictures, big text, and make it very easy to read and understand. Make the flow very easy to understand. Um, and really when you're presenting to a judge at Synopsis, for example, you don't want to just read off your poster because the judge can read off the poster too. Uh, you want to use the poster as a guideline for your presentation and serve as a roadmap so you can point out stuff on your, on your poster when you're talking to the judge. Say, oh, like, look at this figure here, it's so nice. Uh, but you can also see these key things that I found here. Uh, so really the poster is a guideline for your presentation. So synopsis is, uh, as you've heard, the, the regional science fair here. I'll, I'll keep this very short. Um, as it says, it requires uh, sponsorship. You have to get a Harker teacher to sponsor your project. Um, do that early. Plan your project early. Even start now if you're coming here next year. <clears throat> um, and then the, I think the reason to do synopsis is if you're not yet at the, the Regeneron uh, or, or semen stage yet. This is a great way to practice presenting your work. Um, it's kind of a, it's, it's uh, yes, you can get some awards, but really it's kind of a useful endpoint for you to aim for uh, in getting to a stopping point in your project. Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> so Synopsis kind of has multiple different award levels that they provide. So uh, at the regional category, they give you first, second, third, and honorable mention for your particular category. They also provide uh, awards for the CSS for the California State Science Fair, which uh, Mr. Spenner mentioned br uh, briefly. And essentially, this CSSF is a state fair where you can um, uh, compete at the state level. And ISF is what they call the Grand Prize Award. So it's awarded, I think, to 12 projects in total across the entire fair uh, in the high school division. And projects that get awarded ISF distinction essentially um, are allowed to compete at the uh, Intel International Science and Engineering Fair, uh, which is held in different locations every year. 
Um, last year, I think it was in Phoenix, and this year it's going to be in uh, L.A. So ISAFI was a phenomenal experience last year. It, essentially, it brings together scientists from 90 different countries uh, to one central location where you can present your research and interact with a lot of different people. And presenting research is obviously a really important step. You can talk to judges who are really experienced, who have been recruited specifically for the fair, and it's a massive event. So there are many, many students there, uh, and a lot of judges, they actually bring in translators for um, students from uh, out of the United States, and it's really an excellent way to, dis to discuss your ideas with experienced judges who really want to talk to you about what project, what uh, what project you did, why you did your project, um, and also ask a lot more technical questions about your particular field of interest. Um, the I think the more important part of ISF is probably has to do with the environment that you're in, it, and also at uh, science fairs at the international and national level, you get to meet people who are really really cool and really like to do the stuff that you do. So. Um, at ISF, categories tend to be about 60 projects, and there are numerous different categories. So last year I was in translational medicine, and the projects there all had to do with applying um, computational aspects of, uh, or applying something in the computational realm to a medical field. And I talked to people who had used paper to test for different types of diseases, or who uh, I uh, applied different computational techniques to discuss uh, molecular dynamics of particular organisms. And all of the stuff that you see at these fairs is really exciting, and you don't want to waste a day uh, or miss a second of it. So they have amazing events, who, uh, great speakers who come in and you can, who talk to you and who interact with you. Um, some colleges also have events there. But the really interesting part, the really amazing part of uh, ISEF is really talking to the people, the other students there who are interested in, in the same things you are and making lifelong connections, because that's probably one of the only places you can uh, talk to someone from uh, so, so from an like international school and ha talk in the same language of science, and I find that really exciting and interesting. Okay, so there's also uh, the USOIPT. So um, I guess this is a little bit different from what we've been talking about. So the main competitions for research are ISF, CSSF, Synopsis, which are all one category, then uh, Regeneron STS, uh, which is its own category, and the Siemens competition, which is also its own category. Um, and if you don't want to do uh, research from an organized, from like with a program over summer, an internship over summer, but instead are interested in physics and want to conduct physics research at Harker, there's also the program known as the USAIPT, or the USA Youth Physics Tournaments. And this is something I was the captain of this year, and we uh, made the final four. Um, and essentially what this program is is essentially um, where you conduct research over the school year on four presented topics that the USAIPT Board of Directors decides for you. So last year, for example, uh, I presented research on um, the uh, the dynamics of geyser eruptions and uh, the periodicity of geysers. And everything in this uh, in YPT is much more theoretical than it is in most research. And a lot of it has to do with find, uh, identifying equations, reading prior physics papers, and it's all physics based. So um, the work that I particularly did uh, w on that project had to do with um, Wave uh, uh, fluid dynamics equations and identifying how uh, fluid is modeled in a geyser surface and how it erupts and the periodicity of those kinds of eruptions, which is a very unique experience from research, but it's also uh, something that I would certainly recommend being involved in. It's a great program that allows you to delve into research from a different angle than a really competition-focused uh, lens. It's a lot more um, theoretically driven, and at the end of the competition, you it's also international, so you meet... Um, well, sorry, it's not international. It's also national, which means that you can meet students from... Exeter, for example, and other parts of the U.S., and instead of competing and discussing your projects with a judge, you engage in a discussion where you present your work and the opposing team asks you questions about your work. So it's much more collegiate in that sense, and it uh, is very similar to a thesis defense. Uh, and so at that conference, you present your work, and you figure, uh, and at the end of the they rank your uh, team based on your presentations as well as um, the uh, performance of the opposition. So it's a different and really exciting experience. So I'll be talking quickly about Google Science Fair. Um, so I'll be talking about Google Science Fair. So usually submissions open in March, but this year that hasn't happened, so I'm not sure if it's going to happen or if it's just going to um, yeah, if it's gonna take place or if it's just gonna take place later. But I'll just cover the process anyways. So the preliminary stage is where you submit just a write-up of your project so like you talk about 
the intro and objectives, materials, and methods, stuff like that. And then you also get the option to submit a PowerPoint presentation or a video of you explaining your project. And then a panel of judges um, review your submission and then if you get you can get selected as a regional finalist and then possibly a global fi finalist later on. And then from there on you can participate in other activities. And then I'll be and then for JSHS, which is the Junior Science and Humanities Symposium. So it's another research competition, and I'll just go through the stages again. So first, you submit a five to 20 page research paper, as well as an abstract, and a panel of judges reviews and selects some regional semifinalists who will be um, asked to present their project in an oral, um, they'll be asked to give an oral presentation and um, from there you can be selected as uh, f one of five regional finalists who will get the chance to attend the national symposium which is what I did last year. It was really fun opportunity and I got to meet people from all over the nation. It was a great chance to get to learn about what some of uh, what some other high school students are doing as well as get to share my research with judges and um, my peers. Yeah, I did that myself. Okay, so I'm gonna briefly talk about uh, the Siemens competition. So if you aren't a senior, then you're required to submit it as a team project. Um, you can submit individual if you're a senior. Um, the competition deadline is pretty early in the year, so you really want to start your paper um, in the summer because there won't be much time during the school year. Um, Mr. Spinner talked about the advanced research class, so that's a really good opportunity to work on your research paper if you're submitting for uh, Siemens as well as Regeneron. Um, and then it's an online submission, but if you uh, qualify as a regional finalist, then you prepare um, a presentation uh, which is given it virtually, um, and then there's further processes where you can work with Ms. Chetty to practice your presentation with teachers, um, and then if you make it as a finalist, you go to Washington, D.C. to make a presentation there. Uh, so um, after the Siemens competition, there's also a later deadline, uh, also with uh, around 18 to 20 page paper for the Regeneron STS. So Regeneron recently took over the title sponsorship. It was previously known as the Intel STS and then previously known before that as the Westinghouse STS. So we like to just call it STS because that it kind of encompasses all the different sponsors. Um, and uh, the competition is only meant for seniors or those who are in their last graduating year of high school. Um, and the paper you submit is generally either the same as your Siemens paper or very similar to your Siemens paper with a couple of addendums if necessary. Uh, it's also a much broader competition, so it doesn't just look at your paper, which Siemens is only just based on your paper. It also looks at uh, your high school activities. So it's basically a college application. You, uh, when you submit your application, you have to write essays for STS. You have to submit a transcript. You have to um, really everything that goes into a college application. At the end of the day, they select um, a certain number of uh, 300 semifinalists and 40 finalists, and the four finalists uh, attend uh, competition in Washington, D.C., where they ask you lots of different questions and uh, engage in a very much interactive judging process. Okay, uh, so I'll talk a little bit about my personal experience uh, with the Regeneron Science Talent Search. So I applied in uh, November, um, and so I submitted, you know, as Manan described, the 20-page paper, the essays, um, you know, all other parts of the application, like your activities and stuff like that. It really is... Um, pretty comprehensive. Um, and then in January, uh, I was announced as, as one of the 40 finalists along with uh, Manan and Avani. Uh, and so from March 9th to 15th, uh, I tr uh, we, all of the three of us traveled to Washington, D.C. And so that was, uh, that was a great experience. Uh, they don't ask you, it's not just all about your project, it's about you, how do you think as a scientist? You know, it's like how, 
how well do you science? That's basically what, what they try to test. Um, and so they ask you questions about all sorts of things. Like, you know, uh, we got a question, you know, how would you convince ancient Egyptians that bacteria exist, right? Questions like that, which make you kind of think differently, but use science concepts. Uh, and it's really, uh, it's difficult, it's challenging, but it's also uh, extremely rewarding. And then they also judge you about, uh, about your project. And they can uh, combine all that into uh, finally deciding the top 10. Uh, and apart from the judging, it was also a really fun experience. We got to do lots of activities, like an escape the room. Uh, we visited the NIH and met uh, Dr. Francis Collins, who's the director of the NIH, uh, and really meeting the other finalists um, and, and, and kind of getting to know their projects and getting to know them as people and, and all their fantastic ideas and the conversations and the, and the times that we had was a great experience. So, I mean, I absolutely recommend if you're a senior, right, Regeneron is, the science sound search is for seniors uh, only, but you know, once you get to senior year, if you have a research project, you know, I'd absolutely recommend applying. Uh, it's, it's an amazing experience, so. Hi, um, it's fantastic, and I've seen the Harker research program go on and blossom in the last seven years. What you hear today is, uh, is a sampling that seems to get richer, deeper, and, and broader. Can we get a round of applause for the fantastic work that these guys have all done? Um, how many of you are from middle, have kids in middle school? Ah, it's very good, very good. So I'm just going to talk about two things. One is uh, research is, is a phenomenal experience. However, not every child is, is ready, is, is enthusiastic about it, and, and feels like they're capable of doing. I've seen it in my own household, my older daughter who's now in college, uh, first thing, she says, I think I want to do research, I don't know what to do. So she goes to uh, Mr. Spenner's room and says, I want to research. Can you tell me what project to do? And he gives her five copies of Scientific American Magazine and sends her home. And she comes home crying, I didn't get a project, what am I going to do? And, and I think that's a, a, a normal reaction that you can expect for the first timers, uh, parents that have perhaps haven't seen it, haven't done it, or the kids who haven't done it. Um, one thing you should reassure that the, the Harker system, the program, and, and the kids who are you know, sophomores, juniors, seniors that have done this are there. I'm seeing now with my daughter who's a freshman how much support she's getting. So no matter if it's the first exposure, the first time the child is thinking about it, uh, it's kind of encourage them to do it. The rigor, the initiative, the, the learning that you get through the process, whether you win competitions or not, is just incredibly valuable for, for the entire high school experience. So to all the, all the parents who are middle schoolers or freshmen, uh, I really suggest do that. The other thing with that, which I've tried to capture here is uh, you know, the success for kids in school in the research program really comes through their own initiative. Well, as parents and, and really the support we all try to provide here is great, but sometimes we can be overbearing. We might want to say, you know, I want to do this for you. I want to, you're having a problem, let me, let me help you out. But I think the moment we do that, uh, we kind of take away the experience. We take away the, the true power that research brings. And, and we have to provide the support through maybe calling, maybe introductions and things like that. But at the end of the day, if, if the student doesn't take the initiative, the teachers aren't motivated to help them. And, and they have to drive it. Uh, we just should be there to support them. Uh, so that's really, those are the only two things I wanted to convey. I'm happy to uh, answer any questions here or, or afterwards uh, if you have uh, regarding experience. I've seen uh, two of the kids sort of, uh, one gone through and the second one in the, in the process. All right, so I'm going to talk about the Harker parent role from a student's perspective. Uh, this will be interesting. Um, so really, the main point is uh, if your child has an interest in STEM and it's very clear to you that they have an interest in STEM, then you should encourage them to try research. Uh, but really beyond that, you want to leave the, let, let your kid just explore. Um, I don't know, personal, personal experience, my parents were really hands off about it. They were just like, I'll drive you to research every day. And so that's what we did all summer. Um, but so I feel like if you let your kid explore and just like take their own path, it'll be really winding and like they'll go into the woods, out of the woods, uh, but really at the end, end of the day, they'll be proud of the thing, of the work that they did themselves. So that's really important. Uh, and you also want to keep in mind that high school is very busy. Uh, research is not a full-time job for any of us here, and so we are doing a lot of other activities. We also have school. Uh, we have classes that are very challenging. Um, so high school is very busy, so you cannot spend eight hours a day doing research during the school year. 
That's what the summer's for. Um, and also realize that internships don't always lead to research papers, so that's why you want to clarify it, as the previous speakers talked about, uh, with your mentor beforehand to make sure that if you want a research paper, that you can actually get it. Um, and then finally, don't let college applications drive your research process. Obviously, college applications are a real thing, and everybody's going to apply to college. Uh, uh, but don't let it be the driving factor, because once you get into that mindset, you're thinking about the end result, not about the process. And it's really about the process. You want to focus on each step of the research process, not thinking about that end goal, um, because really, you want to do an honest scientific job. And whether that leads to a good result or not so great result, that's just the way it is. And so focus on the process, and don't always consider the end result as your primary focus. So with that, we conclude our presentation. We hope you found it informative. I'm going to have to speak fast, because if you need to get back to Blackford, your bus leaves at uh, 545. I've extended it for you. Uh, just one last thing I want to say. First of all, thank you so much for attending. It means so much to our students, and I hope you've learned a lot. Uh, please do not recycle the program. Inside the program, especially students, there's valuable information. You have the names of locations where our students did their research. You have the names of mentors. And you have project ideas that could be sparked by reading those abstracts. So don't recycle the program. It's very, very valuable. Thank you so much for coming. And we'll see you again next year. We've already got our keynotes in place for the uh, 13th Annual Fair. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs>